All right, our next speaker is Dr. Coma, who received his DVM from the School of Veterinary Medicine in Barcelona in 1990, and then his PhD in swine nutrition here at Iowa State in 1995. After graduation, he joined Val Group, which is the largest European pig integrator, where he's developed his professional career for the last 25 years. His main objective is to provide evolving cost-effective solutions to the different challenges of the company with the combination of applied swine nutrition, sound practical research, economics, and sustainable profitability. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Coma. Good morning to everybody. First of all, I want to thank John Passions for the invitation and the opportunity of being here with all of you today. Of course, I would have preferred to be physically named, but the situation is what it is, and hopefully better times will come. Anyway, it's a great honor to be able to share this session with all of you. Before starting the presentation, just a few words about myself. I got my DVM degree in Barcelona, Spain a long time ago, and after that I came to Iowa State where I got my PhD on swine nutrition in 1995. After graduation, I joined Falcon Punch Group, which is the largest European peak integrator, where I have been working for the last 25 years. Very good memories from my times in Iowa State University, with a special mention to my major professor, Dean Zimmerman. And before you start wondering who is this other guy, this is me 25 years ago with a little bit of more hair. Also very good memories of my colleagues and good friends, three of them in the picture. And unfortunately, I don't have the picture of all the others, but I do hope that today some of them are in the audience. Also, I want to remember the, the people, the, the good people that at that time were working at the ISU Swine Experimental Farm. A few words about Balcom Punch Group, which is a family-owned conglomerate of companies based in Spain, which has developed a fully integrated and vertical I system. Main figures of last year, 2020, were net sales of 2.9 billion US dollars, being the main activity pig production. We own 240,000 sows and we raised 6 million pigs. We also run the largest poultry operation in Spain with 80 million broilers. To raise all these animals, we produce 2.5 million tons of feed and all the animals were slaughtered in our own facilities. So, so that means that we produce 480 million tons of pork, more than half of it was exported, being China the main destination, as you know, for the last two years. In poultry, we produce 140 million tons, everything targeted for the domestic market. Today, I want to give you a European perspective of applied swine nutrition from an integrator standpoint. That means very much focus on cost. I have decided to talk about four different topics. The first one is variability of composition in different raw materials at the feed mill. The second one, feeding non castrated pigs in the growing and finishing stage. The third one, raising pickles without antimicrobials or zinc oxide. And the fourth and last one, the effect of applied swine nutrition on practical sustainability of pork production. We do have an important variability of composition of the different raw materials at the feed mill, mainly because we use a great number of raw materials and we also source from many different origins. That's because Spain is a net importer of grain and protein meals. As you can see in the map, we receive material coming from North America and South America, soya and corn, and we receive a lot of grain coming from the northern part of Europe and the Black Sea area. In this graph, you can see the relative use of grains over the last 10 years. Corn, wheat, barley, rye, sorghum, triticale and rice. And as you can see in the picture, corn in blue, wheat in red, in our market context and in our price uh, market, wheat competes very much with corn as the main grain. The same graph, but for protein meals, soybean meal, rape seed, some flour and peas. And as you can see that despite the bad mediatic reputation of soybean meal in Europe, it remains the main meal by far. 
In this graph, you can see the overall contribution of the different raw materials to the amount of crude protein that's being used during one year. So, as expected, soybean meal represents a significant or the most important part of the crude protein of the feeds, but wheat, uh, protein coming from wheat, represents more than 25% of the total crude protein of the feeds. So that means that for us, monitoring of wheat and its crude protein will be very important. So from an end user standpoint, the challenge that we do have is how we can deal with these important quality variations in, the, in our industrial conditions, which are very large volumes, rapid rotation, different suppliers, multiple sourcing, and not always 100% full traceability. So especially in the current high price, high volatility markets, it's very important to have a solid and precise quality control to characterize well the nutritional value of the different raw materials. So we need to live with this variation and we need to move away from the averages. To do that, first we need to quantify the main factors that are causing this existing quality variation. So we need to measure. And once we measure, we need to manage. That means that we, we need to implement ways to reduce the variation or at least being able to react to it. Selective sourcing, for us, it's not an option because it's very difficult to influence imports and that would require some price premiums that are very difficult to justify when quality is so variable. So we decided to go for segregation on arrival and to do that, we are using the NIR technology as a rapid online reliable way to analyze. As an example, this is the variation in crude protein of soybean meal in a period that goes from January 2020 up to last month. So you can see that the average value is, is okay, but with a huge standard deviation. That's a result of many different factors that are listed here. The type of uh, bean genotype, growing conditions, plant processing, mix of qualities, error in sampling, and different analytical methods. So, First thing, we segregate by commercial type. That means that we use at the same time 44, 47, and 48, and uh, being 47, the main one. Even if we focus on soybean 47, as you can see, variation is still quite important. And this variation has a seasonal effect. That's because the crushing plants that are located in, in Spain, one part of the year, they source from North America and the other part of the year, they source from South America. So that gives a different average value of crude protein. But even within the same day or even the same week, we, have, we do have this range of three points that of course, that's a mix of quality sampling and method. To deal with that, we segregate on arrival on two different products, quality A and quality B. So those two products, they have a difference of one and a half points of crude protein. Of course, by doing that, we reduce standard deviation. And also, of course, the two products, they have different net energy content and different amino acid content. If we move to wheat, as you can see, this is the graph of samples of wheat, crude protein of the samples of wheat for the same period of time. With a, with a standard deviation even higher than for soybean meal. First step is to segregate by, by origin. Uh, we have some origins that have an average content of 10% crude protein and the others 12%. Of course, the two products have a different digestible amino acid content, different starch content, and of course, different net energy value. For wheat, we, the solution that we apply is a daily monitoring to verify that the commercial type that we are using is the right one. And if there is a change, like it happened here, that could be a change of boat or a different warehouse or whatever. So when there is that change, we change the metrics value of the product. Anyway, we are, we are aware that the segregation based on crude protein is not good enough because there are important differences for the same crude protein in rising content and its digestibility due to thermal processing or other factors. So 
as an example, we run this, this test or this, this uh, study where we look at the relationship between crude protein of soybean meal and the lysine content, depending on the origin of the soybean meal. And as you can see, there are some important differences. Being the soybean meal coming from US, the one that had the highest lysine content per unit of crude protein. So the challenge that uh, we will have as in the future is to implement in our industrial conditions the current developments on NAR technology. That means that we need to be able to segregate based on amino acid digestibility coefficients and energy values. To do that, we need to have very solid calculations that need to be developed on whole grain product because this segregation happens on arrival. So we need to measure, but we need to measure to manage. And always we need to find a balance between what is possible and what is pragmatic. So the new system does not need to be perfect, only it does need to be better than the previous one. With that, I move to the second part of the presentation, which is feeding non castrated pigs in the growing and finishing stage. The context of this topic is that in Spain, historically, most of the pigs have been non castrated We use peer train as a terminal sire, 110-120 kilos of a slaughtering weight, that's increasing year after year, to get a final product with a high lean content. The remaining 20% of the market is castrated. We use as a terminal sire Duroc, heavier slaughtering weights. And in those animals, we want to reach a minimum amount of black fat deposition, especially in the ham, because of the important industry, which is the dry cure ham production in Spain. All over Europe, there is also this tendency to non-castration. Right now, my estimate is that more than half of the pigs in the European Union are non-castrated. That's because the obvious advantages on life performance with a lower cost of production, and also because boar tain is not a commercial issue anymore. That, of course, that might have an effect on product variation because of the differences in carcass composition of boars versus barrels. So, if we talk a little bit about variability at the farm, we are aware that this is a growing problem. It's a challenge in all in all out systems. It's causing some inefficiency of multi phase feeding systems, and it's also causing some differences in final carcass composition, which makes more and more difficult to market the homogeneous final product that require slaughter houses. So we decided, we decided to start a company project first to quantify the factors that are affecting the body weight variation, the variability, and second, to evaluate if there were any nutritional strategies to reduce this variation. One, one, strategy, one, one strategy was to see if there, were, if there was a different response to uh, lysine depending on the initial body weight, and the second one was to, to evaluate the effect of sex, boars versus gilts, on the lysine requirement of pigs in the growing and finishing stage. All the work was conducted in our R&D facilities. The results have been published in these five different papers because the work has been part of a PhD thesis of this student, Pawai Malik, who has recently joined our team. Well, we are aware that there are important differences at the beginning of the growing and finishing stage, and these differences became even bigger at the end because different animals have different average daily gain. This, these low body weight animals, they have this type of average daily gain compared to the heavy animals that they already have a high average daily gain but starting at the beginning of the growing and finishing stage. Also, that results in different final carcass composition. This is the graph of hot carcass weight versus carcass leanness, depending on the average daily gain of the pigs. So you can see that the animals that have, that grow very fast, they are also the fatter ones, compared to the animals that are slow growing, which have a leaner carcass at the end. The same type of results in another study that we conducted, comparing two different uh, terminal sires, peer drain or synthetic one, 
Those are the marketing weeks, and as you can see, the animals that were marketed later, they are more lean, they are leaner, in PA train, and the same type of results for the synthetic grain. And the response is different depending on the sex. This is the marketing days versus backpack thickness, and as you can see, PA train male, they are leaner than the PA train female, but the type of response, depending on marketing day, depends on the breed of the animals. In this study, we evaluated the response to different rising levels depending on initial body weight. We evaluated five different ratios of digestible rising to uh, net energy. And as you can see, the response was greater in the small animals compared to the large animals. That's for average daily gain, and that's for heat compression ratio. Great. Then we evaluated the effect of sex on rising requirements, and as you can see, also five different ratios of rising to energy, and the response, as you can see here, was greater in boars than in girls. That's for feed compression rate, and that's for carcass leanness. The data was analyzed in this uh, fancy way to give different requirements of boars and girls in the period of 70 to 105 kilos of body weight. All the data was pulled in a meta-analysis study, and the results of this study were used to elaborate this table. In this table, you have the different requirements for boars and girls in order to optimize average daily gain on feed compression rate for a standard uh, net energy diet. And these are the different values to reach different levels of maximum performance. And as you can see, for the different levels of performance, boars require around 0.14% more rising than gilts and a little bit more for feed conversion rate. And in both sexes, this increase from 98 to 100% maximum productivity requires a great increase in the rising requirement. In this, in this slide, we want to show the effect of a split sex feeding that's compared to a common diet of 0.85% digestible rising and this uh, energy content, that would be a very standard diet. And we analyze the, the comparison of a split sex feeding compared to this, to this diet by using two different criteria, fixed weight or fixed time, and in two different contexts low cost of amino acids and high cost of amino acids. And as you can see, there is a significant economical advantage, especially in the, in the context of uh, high amino acid cost and a fixed weight conditions. The challenge that we do have is how to implement these results in a practical way. The first one, and, and less complicated, would be just to put two feeding lines in each barn, and it's, it's one of the things that we are uh, doing right now. A more sophisticated one would be a system to deliver a different type of composition for each pen. And of course, the more sophisticated one is the individual feeding stations, but that has an extra cost. I move to the third part of the presentation, which is raising piglets without antimicrobials or zinc oxide. The context is that in 2017, the European Commission voted in favor of a ban on the veterinary use of zinc oxide. At that time, a transition time of five years was granted before phasing out the product. But this is ending on June 2022, so in less than one year. And in this picture, you can see the feeling that we got. But anyway, this situation is more challenging in some production systems, like the ones we have in Spain, with winning at 21 days, compared to other countries that win at 28 days, and a nursery stage of six weeks. So that's a very limited period of time to recover the piglets. That will require a holistic approach, that means using many different strategies, 
And the solutions may be different depending on if you are an integrator of, or if you are a commercial feed producer. Of course, pre prevention will be more and more important with more focus on management issues like density, pre-winning conditions, use of creep feed, and so on. We also do think that uh, monitoring of water quality is very important and their acidification plays an important role. The objective altogether is to develop a resilient gut floor. The development of a gut microflora is very important. I think that that's very well proved. There is very good scientific data, but however, it's not yet a tool for an applied commercial nutritionist. We have published two different papers together with the University of Barcelona looking at this development starting at birth towards winning and also the effect of two different diets on performance and also on the development of the microflora. Some of the key nutritional aspects that we do think they are important are first one and most important, the changes in crude protein content and also some changes in the ratios of amino acids to icing, especially threonine and tryptophan. Also, changes in the fiber content and fiber ingredients in the piglet diets, which may result in a decreased content of net energy in these diets. It's important to, to revise all the existing additives, and there we think that organic acids are one of the key elements. For one, we, we decided to use a new stage program, especially in the late nursery, because at that time we want to use the higher average daily feed intake to recover part of the growth that we lost before. In this table, I have tried to summarize the holistic approach of the different strategies, the different concepts, the effect on the intestinal health, the impact on growth, and also an idea about the application cost. So, as you can see, we'll We'll detail a little bit more about this, these ones. And of course, it's important to combine the right additives to get the, 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 the goal that we want. Most important one, crude protein levels of the pico diets. In this graph, you can see that for the same digestive rising content, the crude protein of the feeds have decreased in the last 10 years. Those were the levels in 2010, and these are the current levels in 2021. Okay, that's because more uh, crystalline amino acids have been used, tryptophan and valin. However, these, these levels, these uh, 19 and a half and 80s, are not an option without xenoxide because we do have some enteric problems. So we have decided to start with this new strategy, that is to decrease the rising content of the first diets, and also in order to decrease the crude protein of the, of the diets. So, as you can see, in the first two diets, we stay around 17 and a half, and then later on, we increase, and also increase the, dig the digestive riser, because we want to recover part of the growth that we have lost. So, because up to during the first uh, three weeks, we have a, a loss of uh, half or 0.7 kilos of body weight and an increase of cost of uh, half a euro for each animal. So, we reduce this crude protein by the addition of isoleucine, histidine and leucine. However, that has a limited effect when the ratio of rising to crude protein is higher than 7%. We ran this trial where we evaluated different, different ratios and as you can see, when we go higher than 7, especially up to 7.5%, we have a loss of, of performance and that's because the limiting factor of the non-essential amino acids. Dietary fiber, I think that this was very well covered yesterday in the session of young patients, so as explained, Dietary fiber has different components that play a very significant role in developing the flora because they have different functionalities. This, this graph of this table is a very good summary that was already published in NRC 2012 with the different components, the different methods to analyze them, 
and also the fermentability capacity of the different ones. So we think that the concepts are clear, maybe the economics are not so clear, but anyway, we decided to, to include two different nutrients in our formulations, inner fiber and fermentable fiber. We, we are not sure if there is enough proof to invest money in the requirement, regardless of the price of the fiber sources. But anyway, we play around by using different ingredients which are rich in one or the other, depending on the prices. So, inner fiber includes all these components. Fermentable fiber includes all these others. These are the raw materials that have a high content of inner fiber. And these are the raw materials that have a high content on fermentable fiber that could be rapid or slow fermentation. In soluble fibers, they increase gut motility, they increase the absorption of water, and they reduce intestinal viscosity. On the other hand, when the fiber is soluble, it's more fermentable. Also, if we decrease the particle size of the feed, we increase the fermentability capacity. And that could be good, especially when it's a source of energy to gut microflora, and that could have a beneficial effect at the lower gut segment. So, the question is, should we use different requirements at different stages? And the answer is yes. Probably we want a high content of inner fiber immediately post winning. Then after that, we need to decrease it because it has some negative effects. And on the other hand, fermentable fiber, we want to have a very low content immediately post winning, but probably we want higher content later on because it has also some positive effects. I have tried I have tried to summarize in this table the levels of crude fiber, neutral detergent fiber, inner fiber, and fermentable fiber in diets with zinc oxide. Those could be very standard values in, in our current diets. And a recommendation of what should be done in diets without zinc oxide. So, as explained, crude fiber will increase. Neutral detergent fiber, of course, will also increase. Inner fiber, we want to increase it immediately post winning up maybe to this 4%, but in later stages, we want to decrease it. Fermentable fiber, the opposite way, very low levels immediately post winning, and then in the, in, in the late nursery period, probably we want to increase up to levels of 9 or 10%. However, we should be clear that we are on a learning curve. So we do have a challenge that is to work without zinc oxide in our industrial production. That means that we need to find solutions which are valid for a large scale number of peaks. So we need to find or to reach a safe gut health in all farms, which probably will be very difficult. And to do that, we, of course, without losing the cost. So any solution or any combination of solutions should be very cost effective. I will start the last part of the presentation, which is the effects of applied soil nutrition on practical sustainability of pork production. First of all, the general and well-known definition of sustainability. It's important to remember that we need to find the right balance between environmental aspects together with social and economics. In Europe, we have this increasing demand for feed, focus on feed and animal protein producers, which is coming mainly from policymakers in the form of future legislation, as, that he, as it has been announced by the European Green Deal. Also extended to the financial sector, also coming from society, but this is more social than a consumer demand. Some of the objectives have been published recently by the European Commission, in the form of the strategy from farm to fork. And in this strategy, the objectives, you can see here some of them, climate change, preserve biodiversity, increase organic farming, and there are some already specific targets for 2030 regarding the use of pesticides, the excess of nutrients that are going to the environment, use of antibiotics, and the promotion of organic farming. 
Anyway, the main issues that we need to, to face is that uh, there are some problems in the environment regarding climate change, acidification and eutrophization of soils, decrease of biodiversity and the use of limited sources. So what role do we play in all of this? We use raw materials that are coming from agriculture. In this process, some CO2 is, is already emitted. Then these raw materials are transported to the feed mill and in the feed mill we produce the feed also with some emissions of CO2. And then in the farm and in the manure, there are some more em gas emissions, methane, oxid dioxide uh, nitrous and ammonia. And some nitrogen and phosphor is excreted to the soil and water. So the different components, they have different effects or the different problems. And of course, we need to focus on decreasing the greenhouse gas emissions and the nitrogen and phosphor to the, to the soil and water. So we, we prepare this, this small presentation with a practical quantification of the nutritional strategies that are available to first to reduce the excretion of nitrogen and phosphorus being calculated by nit nutrient balance in the form of uh, amount excreted per place and per year. And this figure is already a requirement to operate, especially in some areas where it even could be a limiting factor. Second, we want to minimize the carbon footprint that is associated for each kilo of product. To do that, uh, we, we use the methodology called life cycle analysis, and that's already a starting demand, especially when the companies want to define the sustainability strategy for the next 10 years. In the future, we think that maybe there will be some carbon labeling of the food as it has started in the coffee industry. If we start with the reduction of nitrogen and phosphorus in manure, there are well-known best available techniques that are already implemented in the industry, multi-phase feeding, reduction of crude protein, reduction of total phosphorus. And also it's very important to remember that any improvement of feed conversion rate due to genetics, farm or health management, it will result also in further reductions of nutrient excretions. So, First, if we talk about nitrogen, of course, we, we had uh, over the last uh, 25 years or 30 years, an important decrease in the crude protein of the diets, especially when more and more amino acids were used in, in a crystalline form. Rising methionine in the early 90s, then threonine, tryptophan, valine, and now we are already implementing the, the use of isoleucine, leucine, and histidine. But maybe now we are getting the limit because, uh, as we have, I have mentioned before, uh, probably we have a, a limit when the ratio of rising, uh, digestible rising to crude protein is uh, higher than 7%. Then, uh, if we make the nitrogen balance uh, per, per peak, we have the nitrogen which is ingested, then the amount that it's retained in the form of meat, the part that is excreted, the one that is excreted, one part is volatilized in the form of ammonia and the remaining part goes into the soil. So that's, that's for one cycle and if we multiply by the number of cycles per year, we have these 3.6 kilos of nitrogen per place per year. If we compare this value to the legislative value that right now is 7.25, we can see that the current value is already 50% lower than the old reference values. And we think that there is also some further, uh, it could, it, there could be some further decreases. If we talk about phosphorus uh, reduction, a little bit the same situation, the, the, the amount of total phosphorus in the diet has been decreased for the last 25 years because of the use of phytases. And of course, with this big difference between the first phytase being used in 1995 to the current ones, so that the, the phosphorus release is much higher in the, in the new generation pallets. 
So nitrogen, uh, excuse me, phosphorus balance, the same thing. The amount ingested, the amount retained through the meat, the amount excreted. There is no volatilization, so everything goes into the soil. So with a final number of 1.54 kilos of, of uh, phosphorus per place per year. If we compare that to the official value in the European Union, you can see that the current phosphorus excretion is 70 to 70 percent, 60 to 70 percent lower than the old values. So maybe the conclusion is that the situation is not as bad as, as it would. If we move to carbon footprint, we have calculated the amount of uh, carbon footprint, the CO2 associated to the production of one kilo of meat. Out of this, the main components is the one coming with the feed, with the raw materials, and the second one is the one that is generated in the farm and in the manure. Then the rest of the components, transportation, farm energy, packer energy, are much lower. If we focus on the one in the feed, this value of 3.7 is coming from the amount of CO2 associated for each kilo of feed. So the figure is around one kilo per kilo. And out of this one kilo, you can see that most of it is coming from production, but also there is a part that is coming from deforestation. If we look at the contribution of the different raw materials to the amount of CO2 per kilo of product, you can see that the uh, grains, they have uh, uh, low content or a low value associated. Soybean meal, it's a little bit higher, but uh, the higher values are coming from soy oil and palm oil with an important contribution of deforestation values. Then, if we focus on soybean meal uh, we, and we compare the CO2 associated for each kilo of soybean meal, we can see that the, the high values are linked to the beans coming from Brazil and Argentina, and especially because they have a very high deforestation values. In the USA, since uh, everything, it's already, it's more than 20 years that there was, in, there has been no deforestation, then there is no value and, and now, uh, all the values coming from the production. So, that's making that, especially in Europe, there is a growing demand of deforestation free products and also some promotion of uh, European protein meals because of that. We think that, uh, you know, that in Europe, uh, meat and bone meal has been banned for many years. And now, maybe, maybe during the second semester, there will be the, the ban will be lifted, but uh, it's uh, Time won't tell. Right? That's a hope that we do have. One of the, the reasons is that also uh, it, it plays an important role in the reduction of CO2 because uh, you can see this is the value of per unit of protein. So the value of soybean meal, the value of rapeseed meal, and the value of meat and bone meal 60%. And per unit of protein, protein is the one that has the lowest value. So advantages is the reduction of carbon footprint increase of uh, circularity and less dependence on imports. If we take a look at the biogenic emissions, you can see that most of it is, is coming from methane, methane that could come from the enteric fermentation, but most of it coming from manure storage, 78%. And the, the emissions of methane depend very much on digestibility of the organic matter. So, to decrease that, it's important to have a good uh, diet digestibility and, of course, to apply the right uh, techniques in manure management. Just to conclude this part is that uh, the industry should have a proactive attitude to the new demands on the animal protein industry. I think it's the only way to survive. That there are tools to continue the reduction of emissions in a sustainable and economical way. That it's very important to quantify any problem before deciding the solution. And I think it's very important that we communicate the right things that we do. Well, before ending the presentation, just a take home message. 
I think that uh, we are living challenging times for the pork industry in Europe. But I think that our job has a great future, but it will require a good dosage of equilibrium, like the lie in the picture, and to take decisions based on data. Anyway, this will not be boring times. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Coma. Uh, I believe he should be joining us. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so, are there any questions? Easy ones. <laughs> Still working, yeah. Thanks, Dr. Coma. Thanks for that presentation. It was it was pretty good. I guess one of the questions is, uh, after looking at the all the strategies you guys are using during nursery uh, to manage health of the pigs. What kind of mortality you guys see during the nursery period? And if you can tell us a little bit, maybe when to finish also, what kind of numbers do you guys see? And also, what will be the main challenges that you guys are um, seeing right now with, with those strategies that you guys are using uh, from the disease standpoint? Well, uh, as I explained in the presentation, I mean, we are still working with uh, single type uh, and antibiotics because the deadline is not until June uh, to in, in one year time. So, so we have a limited number of of, uh, of uh, numbers, a uh, limited number of peaks with without without uh, zinc And for those peaks, we have around two percent extra mortality than the uh, than the standard one. So. So for us, it's it's a real challenge, and as I explained, I think that we need a holistic approach. So we think that uh, well, we'll need to work a lot on the measurements on, on, on strategies at the farm level. Uh, but uh, we'll see. It's, uh, as I explained, we are in a learning curve right now. Dr. Coma, Pedro Relon, University of Minnesota. Uh, Thank you for your talk. Um, one of the, in the uh, presentation we had before, there was a talk about the concern of ASF and the occurrence of ASF in the Dominican Republic uh, for us here in the US. And in Spain, uh, you have had deal with these concerns for longer time than, than we may have had. And, and I see that you, for example, import uh, raw material from from Eastern Europe and and depend on, on importing raw materials. Therefore, I would like to hear uh, your opinion about the uh, potential role of uh, feed ingredients in in uh, the transmission of ASF and how have you uh, addressed this concern if it's present or, or what is your perspective? I'd, I'd like to hear your opinion on that. Gracias. Well, uh, uh, thank you, Pedro. Uh, uh, well, as you say, uh, that's a big threat that we have right now because ASF uh, is, is growing and probably you have seen in the news that in Germany there are more and more outbreaks even in, in domestic uh, animals in, in farm. So, uh, uh, I mean, the first thing that we do is we cross our fingers, but of course we need to do something else than that. and. Uh, uh, we think that uh, the threat is, is, we take some measurements on the feed, but our biggest threat, uh, we think that it's coming from, from uh, you know, live animals that are still imported from Northern Europe to, to Spain, and also the control of the wild boar population. Uh, probably you know that there was also an outbreak in Belgium. Belgium is not so far away from Spain. So that, that's, that's, uh, uh, Let's say that the, the, the big, the big steps that uh, the big controls that uh, are, are being implemented are more focused on on imports of animals and uh, everything related to the to the food products. But uh, regarding feed ingredients, uh, um, let's say we 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 take some 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 let's say some controls depending on the areas and uh, but, but not an important one. So the focus is in, on, on life animals. Dr. Coma. Uh, and of course, that would be, uh, I mean, as, as 
she was explaining the round table before for the US in Spain. I, I mean, a, a, an ASF outbreak would be devastating because, uh, you know, Spain is exporting more than 50% of the production. So uh, if there is an outbreak and, and exports have to be in the, in the country, that would be a disaster. We had uh, the last uh, outbreak of classical swine fever that was in the late 90s, but at that time the, the exports were not as important as, as they are right now. Uh, Dr. Koma, uh, a question on zinc oxide. Uh, a very common strategy for zinc oxide removal is reduced crude protein level. We see that from yes. your presentation. We see that from other countries as well. Um, but uh, a side effect from that is the pig doesn't really grow as well as feeding them high, high protein, right? Um, so yes. in this case, would you say actually the feed intake, I mean, essentially they are being limited on, on the protein, you know, grams of lysine they were provided, right? Um, so in this case, would you say the feed intake in that, you know, early stage are kind of more important now compared to, you know, you're, if you're using a high protein diet, uh, any comments on that? No, I, I mean, you are, you are 100% right. I mean, the, 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 let's say that the, the, the great solution would be to increase feed intake during those first two weeks. But as it was also explained in the round table, I mean, we vaccinate during those days, there is a decreased feed intake, so that doesn't help uh, at all. It, uh, it was also very interesting, the, the, the presentation of yesterday of uh, Dean Boyd. So m maybe there is something else than, than the supply of amino acid for those, uh, you know, for the young pig. Because uh, also we have supplemented to up to isolucine, histidine and so on. And we, 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 we don't reach the same growth that we had before. Thank you, Dr. Combe. I wondered if you could please discuss your incentive structure for carbon footprint and how that looks in terms of what type of documentation you're doing there, or do you have to report, uh, et cetera? Well, uh, we have started just, uh, this is going to be the second year that we, we do that, and, and it's part of the reporting of the company, because you know, in, in, there is a, a big pressure in, in Europe that the companies should have a strategy on sustainability. So we do a, a, a report every year together with, uh, with the financial accounts. So we report the amount, the amount of energy, that, that, what is called the non-financial uh, supply of information. And together with that, we, we make a calculation of carbon footprint. So we, we publish that uh, once a year, and uh, we have committed ourselves to have this decrease in carbon footprint uh, over the, in, in 10 years' time, we, we plan to decrease that around 30% as, as part of, of the company commitment. Dr. Coma, to uh, expand on Mark's question, you spent some time talking about quantifying the carbon footprint associated with production. What efforts from the European industry and from your company specifically have have been generated associated with methane capture and renewable energy production as a byproduct of, of swine production? Uh, th th there is also a, a big push in, 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 our, in our company to, to, to build uh, uh, some large, uh, you know, biogas uh, plants because we think that that, that, that also plays, uh, has an economic value right now in, in, in the European conditions. So we think that that's one of the strategies that we are implementing right now. Yeah. In the interest of time, uh, please let us thank Dr. Coma one more time. Thank you very much.